Today we're going to ask some questions about crypto assets. Are they suitable for personal investment, family investments, institutional? How do people go about it? In the in the preparation for this, we we had actually too many questions to figure out. And the guy said, "Look, let's just focus on one or two of the things that really matter." Uh, so first, I'm going to ask you to each introduce yourself, tell us what you do as a firm, and then tell us about one thing that you think about a lot or or that you're worried about. Uh, in, in this industry that we should address. Uh, let's start with Lucas. Sure, thanks. Um, my name is Lucas Friss. I'm the head of business development for the European region for Cumberland. Uh, Cumberland is the leading global liquidity provider in cryptocurrency. Uh, we are the largest, if not one of the largest, market makers globally for cryptocurrency. Um, typically, we are facing institutional clients, uh, whether they be crypto hedge funds, traditional hedge funds, family offices, etc. Uh, but we also trade with a very wide swath of the entire crypto ecosystem, so payment processors, um, you know, service providers, miners, etc. Uh, we're a subsidiary of DRW. DRW is one of the largest proprietary trading firms globally. Uh, we have about a thousand people spread across nine offices. Um, right now in crypto, we're trading 24-7 in about 30 to 40 different crypto assets uh, on a daily basis, and we trade in about 40 different countries as well. Um, Fantastic. Thank you very much. That keeps you busy. Tom, tell us about you. What are you yeah, up to? Yeah, sure. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Tom Federman. I'm the CEO of Federman Capital. Uh, we are a crypto hedge fund. I'm um, investing all across the asset class from taking positions in well-established cryptocurrencies all the way to participating in private sales and kind of um, investing in uh, companies even before they launch the token. And my background is uh, 15 years of experience in tech, uh, both at startups um, and at major tech companies. Most recently, <coughs> um, I led product strategy and global go-to-market at Facebook, kind of driving um, um, several major ad products. I'm out of the London office here. I'm based in London. Um, I've also spent some time in uh, Silicon Valley um, as an entrepreneur and also uh, went to Stanford uh, um, as a school. Super passionate about the space and that's why, you know, started obviously the fund. Um, so we're going to be here most of the day and happy to talk with people uh, also afterwards. I'm always excited to meet somebody after this last year who has invested directly in ICOs, who still says, I'm super passionate about the space. So, I'd like to ask a bit about that. Uh, are you still currently looking at and participating in some token sales? If so, what are you looking for? Yeah, that's a great question. So, I think, you know, kind of the recent developments are very healthy for the ecosystem, right? Like the craziness that we saw at the beginning of the year and kind of late last year, where you saw a lot of these, um, you know, public ICOs where retail investors just got in, oftentimes without realizing fully the risks involved, is, 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 is pretty crazy. And so I think that what we see right now where the public markets ICO is kind of almost dead, and you know, as an early stage company, you gotta go to investors first, is actually very healthy because that's, you know, that creates filters, right? And it's more, much more difficult to kind of you know, create scams and pass that filter before you get to, you know, to retail investors. And, and so I actually like that it's now kind of more similar to the traditional VC route that we're used to. Um, and, and also it creates, you know, opportunities where the ones who actually make, you know, these, you know, really difficult, make pass through this uh, difficult hurdle. Um, there's, there's some really exciting kind of opportunities and projects that are being developed. So I think hopefully moving forward we will see less scams, we will see more transparency, and, and we will see really exciting opportunities. I mean, that is fantastic news for all the ICO pitchers that are hoping to get some feedback from you over uh, the course of today. So that's actually very encouraging, but it also raises so many more questions that I'd like to to cover. But actually, uh, Lucas, can I chat with you a little bit about the other side of the business, in particular the OTC business? Could you, uh, there are some investors here that are quite new to the space, could you describe what the OTC business does? Sure. So, the Cumberland we're focused on is primarily uh, market making in the OTC space for crypto assets. 
Um, generally, what this means is providing liquidity on a very large scale uh, to institutions who look to access liquidity in crypto, but you know, for a wide variety of reasons, cannot. Um, so you know, the market's very fragmented and bifurcated um, to a point where you know, not only are the markets not easy to access, but they're also not very liquid. And so when somebody's looking to put on a meaningful position in crypto, um, it's often very difficult to f source that liquidity and do so in a way that is secure and that is palatable from a counterparty risk perspective. And so uh, what we're focused on is kind of facilitating that liquidity um, you know, as a trusted counterparty in the space. Um, and that's that's what we do. So, um, but you act as a principal. <laughs> Correct. So, so we're a, we trade on a principal basis. That means we're trading for our own account. Uh, we do not broker any trades. It's not agency trading. We trade bilaterally with various counterparties um, as a counterparty ourselves. So, if I was um, an LP and investing in your fund. Is that right? That I, so, so, so you're totally principals, your own capital. Yeah, it's all, all of our own capital. Okay, so then the, the next question is, um, you do this because you seek to hold some of these kinds of assets for, for capital gain reasons. Is that right? So, so you're buying uh, ETH and BTC in the market for fiat? Sure, so as a market maker, we are on both sides of the market, buying and selling. Um, basically, whenever somebody comes to us to you know, source liquidity, we give them a two-way price and they're able to execute on that price. Uh, we settle within 24 hours and, and that's kind of how our business operates. Would you mind just, because I, this is the topic that's gone on, would you mind describing the process that that happens, including the custody challenges? How do you address those? Sure, so, so as, a, as a principal trader, um, we also don't custody any assets, we don't have any clients. Um, so the custody aspect is something that our counterparties, they have to figure out themselves. And that's a large uh, barrier to entry for a lot of the institutional counterparties that are looking to get involved. Um, you know, a lot of the more traditional hedge funds, family offices, et cetera, they don't have the expertise uh, from a technical standpoint or the operational infrastructure to be able to handle um, you know, custodying and, and securing these assets. So oftentimes they will look to a third party provider uh, some, some people will self-custody. It kind of just depends on uh, the expertise and the infrastructure of that particular counterparty. But there's no doubt that, in, in my mind, the number one barrier for traditional institutions entering this space is 100% custody. Because the, you know, the regulatory aspect is a close second, but there are people who are willing to take that regulatory risk. There are not people who are willing to take that um, risk of you know, securing and custodying these assets when they have no idea how to actually do that. And that's so interesting because uh, coupled with that must be the legal aspect of a contract. And you know, we all understand from the old world finance how escrow works for fiat, for share certificates, you know, you've got DTCC, well, those great institutions that you can kind of rely on. But this is a whole new field. And so is there, um, are there, for example, legal uh, advisors who really understand the space and can, can help de-risk that counterparty risk part of it for you. Tommy, do you, do you want to Yeah, do there's some really, there's some really good actually legal advisors in this space, people who know the space. And but you don't, you don't end up paying their fees to teach them? <laughs> um, I mean, but that's my point. So there's some really good, you know, legal advisors in the space. But the problem is there's no regulatory clarity. And so no matter how good you are, right, if there's no regulatory clarity, I mean, you can just advise basically on how to minimize risk, but there's no you know, track record of like, you know, decades of doing that. Um, and so unfortunately, there is some kind of you know, uncertainty. There's a learning curve we're yeah. going through, I yeah. guess. Um, so can we talk a little bit about liquidity? I mean, th this is what people talk about as one of the attractions potential attractions of this type of asset class. Can we talk about liquidity? Is that one of the things that appeals to you when you're considering an investment in an ICO? Absolutely. I, I mean, for me specifically, you know, I had opportunities to go uh, into VC investing, uh, you know, both when I was in Silicon Valley and also more recently. And I never wanted to do that because I think the model is broken. Um, and I can probably spend like, you know, 30 minutes just talking about that. But in principle, right, like the idea of, you know, the, the life cycle of the fund being, you know, anywhere between 8 to 10 to 12 years and kind of writing these checks and then hoping for the best never made sense to me, right? Like I've, you know, spent my career in tech 
And I can tell you, you know, if two people come to me, right, and they worked on a product out of a garage and they have a prototype and maybe a few, you know, customers, you know, is this going to take off or not? I have no idea, right? Because so many things can happen down the road, right? Like maybe, maybe they, the two founders kind of fall out a year from now, right? Maybe two years from now they're successful and Google enters the space and just crushes them. And so the idea of having liquidity and kind of being able to assess your portfolio every single day and act based on you know the latest developments is a game changer, I think, in many ways. And how should a founder think about this? Think about it from my point of view. In in in, in I won't tell you how many years ago, but I raised a total of forty-three million dollars from seven investors for my company. Uh, but then, as my wife likes to call it, it was my ten-year overnight success. <laughs> right, so this, this is what happens, these things take time. Yeah. If I thought there was the potential for volatility and trading amongst my shareholders, at the riskiest, earliest stage, when actually a little bit of stability would have been helpful, it might throw some dynamics into that relationship that I, I don't want. Do founders think about this these days? I think they definitely think about that, and that's why it's so key to kind of choose the right partners, right? If you're going through the private, you know, private yeah. resale route, and you have the opportunity to kind of uh, choose who you want to invest in your uh, company, then you probably want to choose, you know, partners that are, you know, that are kind of married to that, like see your vision and are married into the long-term vision and can see how this thing can really take off rather than kind of, you know, algo shops that are looking to trade on the volatility. That's yeah. probably not, not a very good probably thing. Not. But actually, on the other hand, if you came to me and you said, actually, I want this block of your tokens, but I want the right to bring in other investors because it brings more liquidity and interest to your business. That's yeah. a great pitch. That I would, I would, uh, you know, listen to that. Yeah. It's interesting that these messages are so new, and thinking about how how they impact us is is a, an interesting uh, thing. Um, actually, uh, Lucas, I was going to ask you: Do the do the pundits and research firms know enough about this to help you with some of your investing decisions? Uh, I think I think to an extent. I mean, there definitely is some expertise in the industry that is that is better than other expertise but the reality is that we are so early in this industry that there are hardly any experts if any um, that said I think that that's one of the trends that we think is going to continue is a much more nuanced and developed understanding of both the underlying technology and the crypto assets themselves um, you know in the market today we see um, you know the, the very tight correlations between coins that in reality when you look at, at you know their technological specifications or how they're meant to function they really <coughs> logically should not have the level of correlation that they have today yeah. we think as the market develops people get a, a more nuanced understanding of, of what they're investing in I think these correlations will start to break down and that's kind of a trend that we're starting to see but it's still going to take some time yeah, I think that the more kind of trading pairs we'll see, right, and kind of as you'll be able to kind of invest directly in the asset that you're interested in rather than, you know, go through, you know, buying Bitcoin or Ethereum and from there kind of converting, then that correlation is also going Exactly. To and also another trend that we're seeing as well is uh, an increased demand for kind of more exotic uh, crypto to crypto pairs. So, for example, people rebalancing their portfolios or maybe um, going from a more liquid coin into a less liquid coin. Uh, right now at, at Cumberland, we're able to quote in over 400 different crypto pairs. Um, and we're, we're seeing kind of the, um, the market share of demand for crypto to crypto transactions from, you know, crypto hedge funds and, and um, active traders to increase substantially. What's the uh, relationship then that you both have with exchanges? Go for it. Sure. Um, so, I mean, you know, we are focused on the OTC market making space. We also make markets electronically on exchanges globally as well. Um, you know, I think that from an investor's perspective, it can be a bit tricky. I mean, there's hundreds of crypto exchanges out there. Obviously, some have volume, some have legitimacy. Um, it's kind of a it's an interesting prospect of kind of weighing your counterparty risk when you're when you're looking to, to trade with various exchanges and so you know that's that's kind of what our expertise is, is that we have these connections and these relationships and we can access this global liquidity pool that you know others either might not be comfortable from a risk perspective accessing or they just don't have the operational bandwidth to 
you know, uh, on board with these, you know, dozens of exchanges. I mean, with the knowledge that you have, an organization like yours is capable of, you know, arbing across a whole bunch of exchanges. Do you do, you do exchange arbitrage work? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're always looking at, at exchanges globally uh, for trading opportunities. You know, we trade on a principal basis. So aside from the market making, you know, we are always looking for trading opportunities. But our focus is really on providing liquidity, uh, whether that be OCC or electronically. Do you, Tommy, do you think there's a shakeout coming? <laughs> More than what we've already seen. Yeah. Well. If, well, I'm thinking about the exchanges. Most of the, yeah. most of the um, theft risk and mistakes are happening at the exchange yeah. level. Right? So I gotta admit that's one of the, I wouldn't say mysteries, but kind of one of the things uh, we're most passionate about. And that is, you know, a big part of our investment thesis is actually related to decentralized exchanges. Right. Um, so you know, I don't. You know, Actually, share share with you what is the, the difference. Yeah. What is a decentralized exchange? Right. So a decentralized exchange basically acts as a peer-to-peer -peer marketplace where you're able to kind of trade directly with you know um, someone else, whether it's you know a market maker or a different participant. But the 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 reason I like it so much is basically there's no counterparty risk if you use the right um, um, tools, right? Because you know. The way it works, right, the tools that we use, basically it's built on top of atomic swaps, right, which means I trade directly from, you know, we trade directly from our wallets and kind of exchange the assets with the, um, you know, with the different party. And, and as a result, right, either the transaction kind of uh, succeeds and, you know, you get the, the asset that you converted or it doesn't and, you, you know, you keep the asset, but at no time do you actually, you know, move part of your asset to a different kind of account and are left, you know, kind of... Who's responsible for KYC? Um, well, in, in this case, it's a good question. And right now, we're starting to see kind of the um, developments in this space to allow also KYC. There's no KYC exactly. for, for some of them. Doesn't that but leave that a massive uh, the danger zone in the industry? It does, which is why you have OTC uh, tests that you can use as well. I think the big risk, though, is centralized exchanges um, and kind of keeping your funds in a centralized exchange. And even, even kind of, you know, moving some of your assets there, making the trade, and then you're kind of relying on them to secure your, um, you know, your assets. And we've seen so many um, examples, right? Like basically every other day where there's hacking into a different exchange. I have no idea what the security protocol is for you know, any given centralized exchange, and I'm not willing to take that risk. Certainly, I'm not willing to take that risk with, you know, um, capital that will uh, manage it. But that's part of your business, right? Is helping reduce that risk. Yes. Yeah, that's right. Exactly, and, and from just commenting on the decentralized exchanges, I think that it's a very interesting idea. I think that if you look at the numbers, the trends of uh, volume for decentralized exchanges right. relative to volumes globally, it is, it is trending up. Uh, it is a very small part of the market, um, but as you mentioned rightly, um, the KYC aspect of that is a big question mark. So I think that on the retail side, um, you know, the, the decentralized exchanges are, are accessible and, and useful, but from an institutional perspective, until somebody solves that KYC issue for the decentralized exchanges, it's going to be difficult to draw a lot of liquidity and volume on an institutional level. To see, that's another that. wonderful opportunity in the, in the space. We're already starting to see those solutions in that space. For instance, right. a company called AirSwap, uh, being based out of, you're, you're probably familiar with them, you know, based out of New York, have built now a decentralized OTC uh, trading desk, with, you know, combined with a KYC partner, uh, which is pretty compelling. Right? I wanted to chat about AML and provenance of crypto when conducting OTC trades. Because, uh, it's, it, you know, this is quite new for me, so I'm, I'm learning as well, but as I, as I understand the challenge is that some people engaging in OTC trading want to buy quite large quantities of things like BTC, but they want uh, proof of first generation ownership of Bitcoin, i.e. they want to buy from the miners, because they can be relatively certain of provenance uh, and that it's, you know, it's a KYC question, isn't it, really? Or beneficial owner question. In that the crypto that they're buying hasn't been tumbled. It hasn't been part of a ransomware bit. How does the industry currently, how do you deal with this currently? Uh, and is there, is, you know, what's, what's the outlook for that? Sure, I, I think it's, it's, a, it's a really tricky question. There are a number of service providers in the industry now who are 
Uh, specifically, their, their purpose is to, you know, KYC, AML, the crypto assets themselves. Including profiling, um, right? In I'm sorry? Including profiling. Is sure. Yeah, yeah, and and so and so they they're able to you know to a reasonable ability um, you know understand where these coins have come from if they are if they've been used for anything else. So that said, I think it's 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 a it's really tricky because it's kind of a slippery slope. I mean, it, you know, fungibility questions come to mind when you when you think about how um, people are going to weigh you know what a you know a, a newly mined coin is is going to look like versus something that's not newly mined. Um, one of the things that we're known for uh, in the past is um, having one in auction from the U.S. government, uh, you know, bitcoins that were put on auction from, you know, various things. So, so in that situation, it was the U.S. government kind of blessing, you know, these coins that were used for illicit means, but now we're putting them back out into the market. So I think there's a number of ways to look at it. I think that no one really has their head wrapped around that quite yet. Um, I think it is an interesting question, but it is kind of a slippery slope. Um, that said, from our perspective, you know, we use a number of service providers as well as internal processes to look at uh, the coins that we are receiving and, and the people that we're trading with in their wallets. And we always uh, are, are, are quite careful from a KYC ML perspective on, on both the fiat side and the crypto side. Tom, Ann, do you have a comment on that? No, um, I think I agree with everything you said. I think I think the I would distinguish between the fiat and kind of the crypto side of the business. Um, Obviously, you know, if you're doing uh, crypto to crypto trading, the KYC is, I think the process is slightly different than, you know, getting into the, you know, getting into crypto and kind of converting your fiat. Yeah, but nothing really to add other than that. You make me think of when you mentioned like the US Rangers legitimizing uh, uh, tokens by taking them from the criminals and then selling them or taking them from, from you know, uh, legal situations where they can and then selling them. I recently had the privilege to interview Tim Draper about his first auction bid for the, um, I think it was 40,000 BTC that he bought the first time around. He told us that he put in a ridiculously high bid of $648, I think it was, per BTC. He said all his friends in the valley who were into crypto told him he was completely off his head to offer anything like that amount of money for it. And he's kind of pleased with that decision. Do we think that there is a case for, uh, not, not really that situation, but do we think there is the, the case for, for example, super rises in value when people start to realize, hey, this is true utility. I, I'm, I'm thinking of it, you know, I, I saw a news item, for example, uh, interviewed Chris Larson from uh, Ripple, and a couple of weeks later we saw an announcement that the potential for the US government to get behind Ripple, to balance some of the Chinese mining overweight focus on BTC. That could trigger some serious interesting gains in things like that, that type of thing, which have true utility. Will we see some, some things like this? And in which case, which ones? Everybody here wants to know. <laughs> Um, I think yes, absolutely. Um, in many ways, I think this is kind of reminiscent of the you know early 90s, right? If we compare it to the internet area era, where I think we'll, you know the big kind of tech companies that are going to emerge in the next 10, 20 years, right? I think a lot of them are going to be based on blockchain technology. And so, if you think about like you know the next Amazon, the next Google, the next Facebook, I think a lot of them are going to be based on that technology, and there's going to be significant opportunity. Uh, Which ones? Just between us. <laughs> <laughs> that said, I think if you look at assets like Bitcoin, yeah. that you know worth over $100 billion at this point, obviously it's going to be more difficult to do 10x or 100x from, from this point. So, you know, I, our thesis is also kind of focused on finding the next Ethereum and Bitcoin, and I think they already exist there, rather than, you know, kind of just betting on Bitcoin. I don't know, I, I still have uh, family offices yeah. who say to me, Eric, I'm buying these for, for our grandchildren. You know, they really are buying BTC because as a store of value, they, they feel it's the closest thing to digital gold. Give me a good shake there, but tell me why. Actually, <laughs> what do you think? Tell me what you think. Is that crazy? Is, is, sorry, can you repeat that? Family offices buying large volumes of BTC just to hodl them for generations. They think these are the things that their you know, families in the future are going to unlock as digital gold. Sure. I mean, I think from a, from an economic standpoint, and you know, the, the 
deflationary schedule of Bitcoin. I mean, I think that, you know, I mean, it's, it's, there, there's a number of ways to look at uh, an investment thesis in Bitcoin and, and any number of other crypto assets. Um, we at Cumberland are not in a position to advise people of, uh, of crypto asset so. investment. Um, we are just here as a liquidity provider, um, and that's kind of what, what our focus is. So actually, that, that type of client that seeks to do that is exactly the sort of person that you want to meet. Isn't sure, it? exactly. And I think, I think family offices in particular are kind of interesting because the really wide amount of approaches that they can take. So, you know, they can invest uh, in, in more of a VC type of facility, you know, in equity investment. They can invest directly in the coins. They can invest in a fund. They can, you know, there's a number of ways to get exposure to crypto. And I think that there, it's kind of an interesting, um, you know, segment of the market because of, you know, they, they don't necessarily have a investment mandate like a hedge fund. Um, they have a lot more regulatory flexibility as they're only, you know, dealing with their own assets. So, I mean, it, it kind of, it's kind of an interesting portion of the market because they have a really wide range of, of, you know, ways that they can get exposed to this asset class. In the three minutes that we have left, I'm going to uh, open it up to the audience for any questions. If you do have a questions, please shoot your hand up in the air, wave, wave, gesticulate at me in a polite way. I can't see exactly well because there's a lot of bright lights shining in our face. Can you see someone? Oh, thank you. Uh, right in the center there, and if we have a microphone ninja, please race that over and give the microphone. If not, would you mind uh, standing, use your diaphragm, project and tell us all who you are and what your lovely Hello. question is. <laughs> Woo! Look at that. A dream team, as Thank always. You. <laughs> I, I got a question about KYC ML. What do you think is enough is enough to do chain analysis and KYC? How far can you go back from the original transfer? Because we don't KYC and email the way they're trying to do it in crypto. Danska Bank in Estonia and all these uh, money laundering places that just took place would all be able to capture. So, when is enough in the crypto space to satisfy the regulators on the coins? Wow. I'll, 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 I'll take that. I mean, I think that it's a really tricky question because, as you said, you know, what satisfies the regulators? I think that in the vast majority of cases, no one actually knows. And so, um, you know, the question becomes, how do you operate a business when you don't know what the rules of, of engagement are? Um, you know, us being who we are, we're a subsidiary of DRW who's been in traditional financial markets for two and a half decades. We treat this market like it is any other market. So we go above and beyond with KYC AML. Uh, we take it very seriously. Um, it's something that is, you know, first and foremost in our process. And I think that, you know, if people look at it like they would look at any other market, um, I think that you know if they, if they do all that they can to prevent uh, you know AML issues or money laundering, money laundering issues, then I think that that is you know that is going to satisfy the regulator until they come out and say this is now what is going to satisfy us. You need to get to this level, but right now there's no answer to that question. A uh, question over there, but I will say by the way, I've just had a, a nod from the side that the next speaker will answer that question. <laughs> So hang on for that one. But we'll have this one as well, please. Stenescu, Alexander Stenescu, legal officer of Gym Platform. Uh, we are deploying automatically master nodes for uh, customers around the crypto world. And my uh, question is related to this niche in terms of crypto investment called master nodes investing and the fact that they can provide you with passive income. I wanted to get your views on how big the market is for you and the interest in general in the crypto world for master notes investing. Thank Interesting. You. Well, first thing is please give me your business card because I think of two of our companies that could use you. That's a sign. Um, what do you think of the business of master notes? I mean, it's a real pain for us. Um, yeah, it yeah. is. It's, um, it, it is. Again, I think it's so early right now that it's kind of how to uh, make a judgment call on, on, on that just yet. Uh, we're looking closely at it, I think it's super interesting. Um, obviously it's a different way, um, you know, to, to, to do these things. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't, I don't have a, a good perspective on it just yet. I think it's a bit early. I, I don't have much either, but I will say that, um, I mean, that is definitely an area of investment that people are looking at as well as, you know, staking and, uh, you know, for example, if you look at uh, Tezos, they're baking and I think that there is no expertise in how to manage funds in that way. And so I think that, you know, there is a market for 
there is space in the market for someone who has that expertise and can manage money for people who are looking to stake, uh, but just don't have the kind of technical expertise or the facility to do so. Um, we will see how that evolves. It's, it's, it's early. Um, I'm going to call it dead because we're going to try today, strangely, to keep as closely to time as we can. We're only about seven, eight minutes over. Please put your hands together and thank my panel.